pretty one, Ulysses. Hello Booktube, I'm Sean the Book Maniac. Welcome back to my channel. Here I am with another totally blind page 112 tag. I'm only going to give a very brief synopsis of this because it's kind of boring to explain it. Not for me particularly, but for regular viewers, for me to give the long spiel every time. So go and check my show notes for a detailed explanation. Uh, this is based on a French literary prize where the judges assess a book's quality and ranking based on its page 112 only with no identifying information about the title or author. It's an actual literary prize in France. I adapted it for booktube and this is the totally blind version. So what that means is in this instance one one of my subscribers, his name is Wilson Shugart, has sent me three page 112 excerpts from three different books. I don't know as I'm filming this what these books are, who the writers are, anything, and I'm going to read them to you. I've read them to myself a few times to, to prepare for this, but I, I don't have any idea which books these come from, and I'm going to give you my responses to them, and you will be making your own responses and judgments about which ones you like and which ones you don't. And at the end, I will rank them for my first pick, second pick, third pick, in terms of how interested I am to actually check out the books. And then I will open Wilson's second email, where he did give me the titles and authors, and I will just talk about the books more at that point. All right, and uh, these are all gay-themed novels, Wilson said. Let's see how it goes. Book number one. How explain to him that she, who had been lapped like a lily in folds of padua soy, had hacked heads off and lain with loose women among treasure sacks in the holds of pirate ships on summer nights when the tulips were abloom and the bees buzzing off whapping old stairs. Not even to herself could she explain the giant start she gave, as the resolute right hand of the sea captain indicated the cliffs of the British islands. To refuse and to yield, she murmured, how delightful. To pursue and conquer, how august. To perceive and to reason, how sublime. Not one of these words, so coupled together, seemed to her wrong. Nevertheless, as the chalky cliffs loomed nearer, she felt culpable, dishonored, unchaste, which, for one who had never given the matter a thought, was strange. Closer and closer they drew, till the samphire gatherers, hanging halfway down the cliff, were plain to the naked eye. And watching them, she felt, scampering up and down within her, like some derisive ghost who in another instant will pick up her skirts and flaunt out of sight, Sasha the Lost, Sasha the Memory, whose reality she had proved just now so surprisingly. Sasha, she felt, mopping and mowing and making all sorts of disrespectful gestures towards the cliffs and the samphire gatherers. And when the sailors began chanting, So goodbye and adieu to you, ladies of Spain, the words echoed in her sad heart, and she felt that however much landing there meant comfort, meant opulence, meant consequence and state, for she would doubtless pick up some noble prince and reign his concert over half Yorkshire. Still, if it meant conventionality, meant slavery, meant deceit, meant denying her love, fettering her limbs, pursing her lips, and restraining her tongue, then she would turn about with the ship and set sail once more for the gypsies. Oh, I like that! Now that's very antiquated writing, but I get the sense that this is like a historical novel rather than an old novel. That's going to be my prediction, that this is not written like it sounds like it could be 18th century, the setting. That's just a guess. Or earlier. But my feeling is it's more of a contemporary historical novel. I find the writing quite a challenge, but I quite like it. Like, it's really well done. It's uh, abstruse, and <laughs> there's uh, 17 line sentences here, but I, I like them. And watching them, she felt, scampering up and down within her, like some derisive ghost who in another instant will pick up her skirts and flaunt out of sight, Sasha the Lost, Sasha the Memory, and so on and so on. Like, that's, that's, that's really 
Good prose. That, that prose rolls difficultly, but still trippingly off the tongue. And she sounds... Uh, is it? Is her name Sasha? I couldn't quite... I think so. She's coming back to Britain for after having been on some kind of a very adventurous sea journey or visit to faraway lands and had lots of intriguing adventures. I quite like her and I'm very curious. Like, I like her feistiness or her independence wish to remain independent and her kind of dread of coming back to her home country. Yeah, I'm really curious about this one. I don't see anything GLBT related other than she had been lapped like a lily in the folds of Padua soy there. That could be something kind of something kind of L-ish, lesbianish. She had lain with loose women among treasure sacks in the hold of pirate ships. This is very interesting. I'm very curious about this one. And aside from the fact the writing is not simple to read, that is not a bad thing for me in this case. So yeah, I like it. Book number two. This one I'm going to start with the fragment that's at the beginning of the page. I don't always, but here it gives us a little bit more of a context. So it starts, this fragment starts, prone to the most inexcusable shakes and shudders. My legs thin, my sex mortified into muteness. I imagined that if I were to still give her the shivers, they were more likely to be spasms of revulsion. That my companion in the railway carriage had thought me beautiful was a joke. I was hideous, a spent thing. I pulled my shorts and vest back on, unwilling to sleep naked. I didn't want the sensation of Mrs. Cantwell's well-worn sheets against my body. I couldn't abide any touch that might suggest intimacy. I was twenty-one years old and had already decided that that part of my life was over. How stupid of me. Twice in love, I thought, as I closed my eyes and placed my head on the thin pillow that raised me no more than an inch or two from the mattress. Twice in love and twice destroyed by it. The thought of that, of the second love, made my stomach turn violently and my eyes spring open as I leapt from bed, knowing that I had no more than a few seconds to reach the sink, where I threw up my beer, sandwich, tea, and apple tart into the wash basin in two quick bursts, the undigested meat and spongy bread forming a deeply unpleasant picture in the porcelain base, a mess that I washed away quickly with a basin of water. Perspiring, I collapsed onto the floor, my knees pressed up against my chin. I wrapped my arms around them, pulling my body close as I pushed myself hard between the wall and the base of the wash basin, scrunching my eyes up tightly as the terrible images returned. Why did I come here, I wondered. What was I thinking? If it was redemption I sought, there was none to be found. If it was understanding, there was no one who could offer it. If it was forgiveness, I deserved none. Okay, well, this one doesn't grab me quite as much, but it could just be a bad luck of the draw for the page 112. The writing is fine. Now, would this guy just finished having sex? Or is he on a train? Yeah, he's on a train. I think. Or he had recently been on a train. Yeah, no, I don't think he's still on the train. Okay. But I think he had sex with somebody and didn't enjoy it. So if this is a gay guy, did he have sex with a woman? Or did he just have bad sex? Or am I completely off base and reading sex into everything as usual? <laughs> it's very dramatic, almost melodramatic, the emotions. There is a, there's an interesting resonance, though, actually, between all three of these excerpts. But the between the first one and the second one, this is in many ways very different. But there's a sense of kind of dread or what am I getting myself into or what was I thinking kind of a crossroads vibe to both of them but this one doesn't really appeal I once I hear more about the book I may decide otherwise and again I think because of the vivid description of the vomiting this is not a novel written a long time ago but it's set maybe a hundred years ago or maybe maybe less but but written you wouldn't find a novel from 1920 or even 1940 that would describe throwing up in quite such vivid detail. So, But mm, it doesn't grab me as much. Book number three. Now, this one is interesting, so watch the the way that I set up the when I type up the extracts because the, there's an italicized sentence at the beginning and 
another one at the end. And I can't figure out what that means. What does the italicization mean? Is a quote from something else or uh, an excerpt from a letter or diary? I don't know, but I'm very curious about that. I hastily walk away, filled with the bitterest envy. The guests filled up a whole ferry getting back to Manhattan for the celebration at Mrs. Woodhull's house. Walt tried to hide away in the bow, but little Picky followed him there. Well, Picky, Walt said, now you have a mama. Picky shrugged and showed him two uncut emeralds, which he pulled from his pocket as Walt talked. They are for my brother, but you may have one, since you are for my brother also. When Walt didn't take either jewel, he put them away and said, My brother is absent. Your brother is absent. They are absent from this boat, absent from there and there. Picky pointed with either hand at Brooklyn and Manhattan, and then up over his head. They are absent from the sky. The whole world is made of the absence of brothers. He took Walt's hand and stood with him in the bow under swarms of gulls flying in circles above the boat looking back at the milling radicals swarming like the gulls around Gob and his bride. Walt had been the very first to congratulate them. He made sure of that, that his congratulations was first and heartiest. He kissed Gob and said, My dear boy, I am so very happy for you. Now Walt looked away from Gob and the new Mrs. Woodhull and stared out across the water at the place where the tower for the great bridge rose high on the Brooklyn shore. Had he gone there one strange night with Gob? Had Gob borne him up to the top of the Brooklyn Tower and showed him the impossible vista? It all seemed unreal. Every year of perfect, loving comradeship seemed unreal and impossible. A ridiculous dream inspired by loneliness. I, too, knotted the old knot of contrariety, blabbed, blushed, resented, lied stole, grudged. Okay, I really like that. That's my favorite. Again, set back in time. This one has a feeling for me, maybe late 19th century. I don't think it's written at that time. I think it's a historical novel set back then. And it seems like Walt and Gob, the groom, had a relationship. Uh, uh, maybe I'm reading too much into that. But no, the writing is really lively. The things that come out of Picky's mouth about the whole world is made up of the absence of brothers, that's intriguing. And I'm really curious about the, the italicized sentences at the beginning and end. I like it. I like it a lot. So, which of these would you rank most interesting to, to least interesting? For me, none of them seem boring, but book number three would be my first pick. I'm really curious about the story, the love triangle, whatever, and what's even what's going on between Walt and Picky. Very intriguing. Close second would be book number one, because I'm really interested in this woman, if her name is Sasha, who's on a boat going back to Britain after a skanky trip abroad, and uh, quite intrigued by the dense, old-fashioned prose. And if I hear more about Excerpt 2, I may up my interest in it, but right now it's kind of a distant third. Didn't make any comments about uh, his sex being mortified into mutinous, but there's a PhD thesis. Okay, so those are my impressions. Let's find out what these books are. Well, oh my goodness, did I ever get bamboozled. I'm completely discombobulated now that I know who these are. So my second pick was book number one. Book number one is Orlando by Virginia Woolf. She's maybe my favorite writer, but I've never read Orlando. Okay. Huh. And I never was really drawn to reading Orlando. I sure am now. Okay. And book number two, which was my least favorite, is from a novel that I have in this stack by the novelist who wrote my favorite novel published last year, 
John Boyne. This novel is The Absolutist, and I have a copy waiting to read. It's so interesting. And then book number three, I think I've heard of the author, but I've never heard of, I don't think I've heard of this novel. The novel is called Gob's Grief by Chris Adrian, and that was my top pick. All right, so fascinating. He uh, chose some good books, and totally I wouldn't, didn't, uh, because I've never read Orlando, certainly didn't recognize her writing style. So let's see, he's given me a great little summary of each book. What I knew about Orlando already was it was a Wolf's love letter to Vita Sackville West. And the main character, there's a lot of gender fluidity. The main character, Orlando, who is based on Vita Sackville West, is born a man, but then transforms into a woman. So lots of gender-bending, interesting trans stuff going on. He says, uh, the writing is much more accessible than any of her other novels. I like her writing style in, for example, Mrs. Dalloway and To the Lighthouse. But yeah, now that I've sampled page 112, I'm very likely to pick it up. And book number two is The Absolutist by John Boyne. Uh, many people who love The Heart's Invisible Furies had advised me that the next one I should try is The Absolutist. And I got it as a gift so it's somewhere. I think it's in this stack. So this is a very gay story set in World War II, and he said he didn't, uh, Wilson said he didn't want to tell me too much about the plot, just so I'd go into it and just experience it for myself. So I think that I was just unlucky that that little bit of narrative on page 112 didn't really grab me, but I loved John Boyne's The Heart's Invisible Fury, so I'm very likely to pick this up. In fact, I was already planning to. I think I'll get to it with this year, hopefully. And so I'm so curious about the third one, which was my top pick, and I don't know anything about it. But he's written a wonderful summary of his impressions and various critical reactions to this novel. And he says that he's a little bit worried that it has a fantastical element he's not sure if I will like. And that Walt Whitman is one of the characters in the novel. Now, I don't really react well to having historical characters in my fiction, but based on the strength of this passage, maybe that will be okay. Gob has a project to make a, invent a machine that will bring the dead back to life. So there's magic and robotics. He said at the end he kind of realized he'd given me three works of historical fiction and that he kind of gathered maybe I wasn't into historical fiction. I don't think that's true. I, just, I think there's a difference between literary fiction set back in history and the genre historical fiction. And the genre historical fiction I usually find unsatisfying. That's a subject for another video. Wilson says about this novel, Gob's Grief. It's about grief and loss and retrieval. That's a very beguiling description. No, I, I'm definitely going to check it out. So do you know anything about Chris Adrian, Gob's Grief? Have you read any of the others, Orlando by Virginia Woolf or The Absolutist by John Boyne? What was your ranking? Thank you, Wilson. This was a really fun, totally blind page 112 tag. I really enjoyed it, and I'm looking forward to checking out really all three of those books. If you're interested in sending me some page 112 excerpts, please put a comment below. I don't think I'm going to do them on a weekly basis for a while. I think, you know, maybe once every two weeks or whatever, but I still really enjoy it. Wilson is has been the most dedicated uh, commenter. He just loves this tag, and several of you do, but I don't want to overdo it, so I'll do it a little bit less often, but still really enjoy it. All right, that is all I have to say. Thanks for watching.